Thank you for coming. Thank you to Todd and Katie for organizing this. This is my second time picking up Bill. The first one was seven years ago when I had a company. Now I don't have a company, but I'm even more stressed now. <laughs> Subject is a little bit more controversial. This talk is not about this. And I'm, treat, I'm gonna treat this company kind of like Voldemort. Not gonna even talk about it. <laughs> Why? Because what I want to talk to you about today is kind of like speaking about free and open source software. If you're gonna go to talk about open source software, you don't have to speak about Microsoft or about Apple. You just focus on your subject, right? So that's what I'm gonna do today. And this company is gonna get the Voldemort treatment. A lot of big corporations have uh, practices that uh, people are, don't agree with, like the DR, DRM management, how they treat your data, what they charge for the products, right? There's a lot of people that are very upset with the way that software companies are run and the products are uh, released. But if you're upset with Apple, you will not go to Richard Stallman and psst, just crash his laptop, right? This is exactly what the Western anti-GMO activists do. They are very, very upset with Monsanto. We don't like Monsanto. Oop, sorry. Oop. We don't like that company. So we're going to go to a third world country to a research field that's completely unrelated and we're going to bash it and destroy it. Doesn't make any sense. And I understand, uh, again, a lot of people are upset with corporations but it's hard for them to distinguish between the corporations and what they do. There are companies that release software and there are groups of people that release software. There's a difference. Software, IT, can be made by different actors. Biotech is the same. Biotech can be made even by communist countries like Cuba. If you go to the World Intellectual Property Organization database, you check for Cuba and transgenics, you see a lot of patents of bacteria, mice, rabbit, goat, that, have been, uh, that Cuba, uh, the Cuban scientists are working and developing. So again, uh, if people have a beef, they, they have a particular problem with companies or uh, corporations in general or with capitalism, okay, fine, that's fair, but you don't have to reject a full technology, whole field, just because you don't agree with certain things. And there are some examples of biotech that has uh, been produced by the public sector, either by itself or collabor collaborating with the private industry. Uh, this gentleman is smiling here with these eggplants because these eggplants are insect resistant. These eggplants have a gene that when the uh, insect comes and eats it, it dies that the same protein is harmless to us. It's just like chocolate. We can eat chocolate. Dogs get ill if they eat chocolate. This is the same with this protein. This uh, uh, has been released by the government in Bangladesh, and there are commercial varieties, but there are also varieties that are given to the farmers for free that they can, they can take the seeds and replant next year if they want to. There are also hybrid, um, high-yield varieties that are sold commercially. And why is this important? Because these farmers are not trapped in the Middle Ages and they do everything organically and they are very happy. No, they have to deal with these insects uh, currently. And the way they used to do it, the way it is still done in many places, is like this. You have a farmer that has zero equipment protection, fancy like they use here in the States, in American farms. They spread the pesticides this way. This is something that's going on right now. And we have a solution, this, uh, or part of the solution, this particular eggplant. A typical farmer in Bangladesh can spray an eggplant crop between 80 and 100 times without protective equipment. And they do this because they have to eat. I mean, some of these farmers don't even, cannot even go to the market. They, they, they have to spray what they eat. And they, they give this to their children. They do this because the alternative is insects eating your crop and you don't get anything to it. So you will have something rather that's slightly poisonous and will, might kill you in the long term, or will you starve? What will you choose? The choice is obvious, right? So now we have a solution that has decreased 
the amount of times that the farmers have to spray it almost totally. Farmers now have to spray between two and five times. That's a huge difference. So this is only one of the applications of biotech. There's also this drought-resistant corn that is being developed in, in Africa. And this is a comparison of uh, uh, genetically modified corn that's drought-resistant and, uh, and is uh, resistant to a specific uh, plant disease with uh, regular commercial corn. You can see the difference on how green the plants are, how tall the plants are. And again, we're, uh, experience, we're experiencing climate change and we have problems. We have solutions to these problems, but these solutions are we cannot even use right now because the excess of regulation means that these test fields need uh, anything that comes out of there needs to be burned. And every country has its own regulation. So even if I prove in Mozambique that the corn is safe and the people can eat it, in Tanzania they still have to go through this and they still have to burn this. To me, this is almost a crime. This is perfectly good food that could be helping people have to be burned because of silly regulations. I mean, there has to be some sort of regulation, but just repeating the same things all over again just doesn't work. Again, in bananas, we have this uh, uh, disease that's called bacterial wilt that kills completely the, the fields. And there is, again, a genetically modified banana uh, that's resistant to this, this plant disease. When you don't have the genetically modified uh, banana that's resistant to the disease, you have to burn every single plant that you have that's infected before it spreads. You, you should not eat it, you should kill the, the bananas, everything. You, you have to uh, kill it with fire. And, uh, but there is a solution that no, again, no one has access to because the extreme regulation. And bananas are very, very diverse, but unlike us, that we have our sexual needs, and you know, it's a, something that we need, as we saw this morning, bananas don't have sex. So it's very difficult for us if we find the strain of, an, of banana that's resistant to a fungus or to a bacteria to cross it with another banana. So what is it that we do? We, we try to find genes in other species of bananas that have uh, the desired traits. And also, oh, sorry, I, uh, this is uh, another slide of uh, uh, plants that are resistant to nematodes, to tiny worms that eat the roots. So we have plants that are resistant to bacteria, uh, virus, uh, insects, and nematodes, all with genetic engineering, minimizing the use of chemical pesticides. We were talking about the banana diversity. So they found this banana in Micronesia, probably not too far from uh, the floating island project, that has uh, vitamin A. They took the gene of this particular banana to avoid controversy because people freak out, oh, you're taking bacterial genes and you're pointing to corn. No, no, we don't want that. So they went to this place, to this tiny island in the Pacific. They found the banana. They carefully took a gene out of the banana. They put in a regular banana. And you will think that's enough, right, to calm people. And they start doing tests and hell no. People were protesting still this banana. So we're creating a banana that corrects the vitamin A problem that can be given to children, that you can give for free to people that are already eating banana, that banana is part of their culture, is part of their cuisine. You take a gene that's from the same family of plants, you do human trials, and people still protest. There's no way you can engage in dialogue with these people, and we should not be having to talk to these people because these fears are irrational. And okay, you should be free not to eat GMOs if you don't like them, but people like this gentleman here should not be able to prevent others from benefiting from biotechnology. Why? Because we already have serious problems. We have real problems that no one cares about. This is the Orinoco Mining Arc project in Venezuela, where I come from. This used to be lush rainforest. This is right next to the Amazonas. A huge mining project with companies from Russia, from the United States, from China, has been allowed here, and it's killing 
a lot of species that we don't even know. We don't know anything about this. I'm sure that species that here that no human ever saw, we lost it. And it's a huge ecological damage. It's almost a crime to me as a biologist. But you go to the Greenpeace website, there's nothing about this project. But you go and you try and you find tons and tons of information about these hypothetical, theoretical risks that no one has ever seen. So opposing irrationally biotechnology creates more suffering and creates this type of problems. Why? Because this is, this is not done for fun. Oh, let's go to the Amazonian rainforest and destroy it for fun. No, let's do it for mining, for profit. If people in developing countries had other sorts of incomes, instead of having to give their land to these foreign companies, they could say, hell, no, no, we can make money other ways. So you know what? If you want coltan or bronze or whatever minerals, send a robot with AGI to space and start mining asteroids, you're not going to touch your land. So what could people do about it? Well, a whole herd of goats could give you enough recombinant insulin and other proteins that will offer roughly the same amount of money that you get from mining. And the ecological impact of a herd of goats or a herd of cows or a batch of bacteria is a lot lower than a whole mining project. This is sustainable technology. We people in developing countries could be learning more biotech. I mean, you Americans have these crazy issues with insulin and other drugs going higher and higher and higher every year. We could offer market solutions to that. Hey, we're going to sell it half of the price. Maybe no one will buy from us, but just the pressure will make drugs in America go lower. I don't know, but there are many, many possibilities. We could be developing anti-cancer treatments. The cost of a, of a biologist down there is uh, a lot lower than here. Companies could be moving there to do research or many other places, but we aren't because we have this irrational fear to biotechnology, and we have to get over this. I mean, this, what I told you, this is not hypothetical. This is not theoretical. This is happening all over the world right now as we're speaking. We need to do something about it. Biotech is not a luxury. It's something that will be nice to have. Biotechnology needs to be a part of a sustainable future for 9 billion people. This is uh, what I want to tell you today, and thank you very much for your time.